Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know you're tired and hungry, and uh, I will try to be as fast as I can. So uh, today we're going to be talking about risk assessment in, in hypertension and uh, the individu individualized uh, blood pressure treatment. So um, in this short talk, I will be talking about uh, what, what is happening already before and um, the risk assessment approach, what's happening currently after 2017, and then future implementations, uh, implications for uh, individualization of treatment. So we uh, already do and we've been doing individualization in treating blood pressure a um, long time ago. Um, part of it is the risk assessment. So we individualize treatment based on risk assessment and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, we individualize treatment based on safety and side effects, based on the pathos pathophysiology mechanisms based on genetic predisposition and uh, the well-known compelling indications and comorbidities. So we already do that. Uh, I'll start by uh, talking about what we used to do uh, and still do, and then we'll go to risk assessment. So we all know that uh, pathophysiology of hypertension, uh, the cardiac output, the contractility and heart rate uh, multiplied by the peripheral resistance, um, in young, mainly, it's, uh, the problem is in increased cardiac output. In elderly, the problem is mainly in the peripheral resistance. This is the complex interplay between all the uh, pathophysiological mechanisms. Um, but there are three main uh, pathophysiological mechanisms uh, that we try to target when we treat hypertension. So increased sympathetic activity that increases the total peripheral resistance, increasing the heart rate and vasoconstriction. Uh, increased vaso renal vasoconstriction primarily, um, increasing the renin, angiotensin uh, two, uh, and the resistance. And this uh, also activates the aldosterone and causes fluid retention and hypertension. Uh, low renin and disrupted pressure naturesis, uh, which is also called salt sensitivity, uh, can cause fluid retention and uh, raised blood pressure. Other mechanisms also like oxidative stress and reduced nitric oxide also exist. But focusing on the, these three, we already um, keep this in mind and try to uh, uh, customize our treatment based on what we think the patient has as a primary mechanism for his hypertension. So if there is an increase in sympathetic activity, you can use beta blockers. Um, also, we can use calcium channel blockers. Uh, if there is, the problem is mainly in the brass uh, system, then we use ACE, ARB, and uh, uh, aldosterone ant and antagonist, MRI. Um, low renin and disrupted pressure naturesis, uh, we focus here on salt restriction and diuretics. So this everyone is doing already. Um, and uh, the, the new thing is the risk assessment, which is not very new, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll give you some more examples of individualized treatment that happened in the past. Um, so the compelling indications, I'm sure everyone remember this uh, uh, slide. This is from GNC8. Um, there are compelling indications for uh, prioritizing one agent over the others. Uh, also, there are a lot of diseases um, in which we individualize treatment as initial therapy. Uh, so this is from the Hypertension Canada uh, 2020, and it's, it's a very good um, review of uh, what to give first in certain uh, illnesses and diseases. So, uh, and also you can find the same one in AHA 2017 guidelines. So this is just an example. Uh, also, uh, one more thing that uh, happened in 2020, a beta blocker is back to be a first line in young patients who, in whom we think that there is uh, um, increased sympathetic activity and uh, increased contractility. So um, Hypertension Canada, this is the guidelines. Beta blockers can be used safely as a first-line therapy in younger patients only with uncomplicated hypertension. So we do individualization already. 
Uh, we also do individualization based on safety, and maybe Dr. Inas uh, just spoke about this uh, before me uh, in depth. So there are medications that we use in pregnancy and medications we don't use. This is individualization. Uh, we individualize treatment based on age and frailty. Um, although this was very strict, uh, JNC8, uh, they um, targeted the blood pressure of 50 over 90 in anyone who's more than 60 year old. So we don't do that uh, anymore unless the patient is really not tolerating and there are side effects from treatment. So this is what we do and we used to do in the past. Now we'll talk about risk assessment, cardiovascular risk ass assessment. Uh, it's a must when diagnosing hypertension, so all guidelines say that. We recommend risk assessment in all adults with hypertension. Um, and we also know that there is a doubling of the risk uh, from, of, of uh, sorry, doubling in the risk of death from stroke, heart disease, or other vascular disease for every 20 millimeter systolic and 10 millimeter diastolic uh, blood pressure. And uh, we also know that the higher the cardiovascular risk, the more benefit of blood pressure lowering in preventing CVD events. So um, in high risk patients, there is a greater benefit. Uh, so the, the benefit is greater than a low risk patient from lowering or intensively lowering blood pressure. And this is what we will uh, focus on. Um, the one size fit all, what's the problem with one size fit all? Focusing only on numbers without taking into account the different risk profiles for patients. Um, if we do one size fit all, then patients with high risk uh, will be, uh, a lot of patients with high risk not receiving adequate treatment. There will be unnecessary treatment for patients with high risk, for, uh, for example, look at this proportion of adults from Framingham study classified into JNC6 uh, risk group. Um, so people who need treatment will not be getting it, and people who don't need treatment are taking extra medication. Um, also, uh, this is from the enhanced population, shows that there is a considerable number uh, of people with high risk, uh, but their numbers don't qualify them for treatment. The upper slide are the ones with blood pressure between 120 to 139 systolic, and the lower slide uh, is uh, above one, 140. So the upper one, you can still see that there is a number of patients with high risk, uh, uh, 7.8, their cardiovascular risk for 10 years is 10 to 14%, this is high and 5% uh, with 15 to 19% cardiovascular risk in 10 years. So all these patients are not receiving treatment if we only focus on numbers, uh, which is what we were doing before. Um, also, uh, the relative risk uh, is kind of stable along the different uh, five-year risk of CVD on the left, but um, with increasing cardiovascular risk uh, 10 years, you see that the absolute reduction in risk is very uh, great when uh, your risk goes high. So the absolute risk uh, changes a lot, even if the relative risk is stable. Um, now, there was, a, just to convince you more, uh, this is a nice simulation study on US population uh, looking at potential cardiovascular disease events prevented by applying the 2017 guidelines which focused on risk assessment, or it was a semi-risk-based uh, approach, and compared to the previous uh, JNC guidelines. So uh, the simulation tell us that if we use the risk-based approach, uh, like in the 2017 guidelines, we would prevent three million uh, cardiovascular disease events. And this compares to uh, 2.6 million if we use the JNC7 numbers and uh, 1.6 million if we use the JNC8. Uh, and there is another 
simulation study also divided patients uh, into uh, target, treat-to-target and benefit-based treatment. So the treat-to-target is what used to be done, focusing on numbers, and you can see the numbers. And it wasn't a very bad uh, um, treatment targets here. Um, and the benefit-based um, treatment uh, focused on risk assessment on five-year expected event reduction by more than 1.7%. But if their blood pressure was more than 150, uh, they will receive treatment anyways also. So um, uh, you can see here that when we compare the two groups, the treat to target and the benefit-based treatment group, you can see oh, again the same thing that 4.2 million uh, CVD events would be prevented with the benefit group. Uh, compared to 3.3 million with the treatment to target. But there is another thing here. Uh, you can see that those in the uh, benefit-based treatment or the risk assessment-based treatment used less medication. They needed less medications. So um, the treatment uh, based on risk assessment is not only effective and more effective, uh, it is also cost-effective and uh, uh, reduces the uh, healthcare expenditure on blood pressure medications. So this is the um, new approach, let's say. The blue on the left is our previous approach. We only focused on blood pressure numbers. Um, this resulted that most people having cardiovascular disease event were not recommended for treatment, and some patients took treatment despite very low risk and they did not need treatment. The new recommended approach is to still consider the blood pressure numbers, they're still important, but also consider the risk profile of the patient. And uh, to do that, most uh, guidelines use the 10-year uh, CVD risk. Uh, there are many calculators. Every um, country ha have their own calculator. The, of course, there is the Framingham. There is the uh, pooled uh, calculator used by the ACC in 2013. There is a Canadian one. Uh, in, in our area, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, risk calculators. I think maybe we should uh, develop one. Uh, but. Um, I think there is one in the UAE population. I haven't looked at it, though. Uh, but I think we need to develop a 10-year risk calculator for a GCC population. Um, anyways, with this new recommended approach, the treatment will focus on patients most likely to have events, so they will benefit. Uh, there will be more CVD events prevented. There will be more Kali's, uh, quality adjusted life years saved. There is lower number needed to treat and a larger absolute CVD risk reduction with treatment. <clears throat> so I hope that uh, uh, we all uh, try to focus on this from now on. Um, now, how did this risk assessment approach m impact the guidelines? First, it's not something new. It appeared for the first time in 1997 with the JNC6 uh, guidelines uh, where they um, classified groups uh, based on their risks into A, B, and C. So A was the group with no risk factors, no organ damage, and no clinical CVD. Uh, B had one risk factor, but not diabetes and there was no organ damage or clinical CVD. Uh, and group C is the highest risk, so there was a target organ damage uh, or clinical CVD or diabetes. And uh, as you can see, they took into account these risks in addition to the blood pressure uh, numbers. But unfortunately, in the JNC7, uh, they abandoned this and they reverted back to focusing on BP numbers alone. Uh, but that idea was there. Now, um, what happened in 2017? Uh, in 2017, many guidelines 
included risk assessment into the, their BP treatment paradigm. And um, the new approach, as we said, is to combine both risk assessment and blood pressure numbers. So um, I'll show you how this affected some of the international guidelines. Um, I'll give you five examples. So it affected the nomenclature uh, of, and definition of blood pressure, thresholds to treat, BP targets, investigating mass hypertension, and the intensity or frequency of follow-up. Starting with uh, nomenclature. Um, so as you can see, um, the change was that uh, the definition of blood pressure um, changed and we now have the previously called prehypertensives classified into two categories, elevated BP and stage one hypertension, where stage one is now uh, reclassified into stage two hypertension. Uh, the other thing that changed, uh, this is from the AHA ACC uh, 2017 guidelines. You can see that stage one hypertension patients, if they have high risk, they would be treated with medications. But if they have low risk, then you can go with uh, non-pharmacological treatment alone and reassess in three to six months. So um, we, we, two patients with the same numbers, um, stage one hypertension, one you will treat because he has a high risk profile and the other one you would treat with non-pharmacological treatment only uh, because they have lower risk profile. The other thing, uh, this is from Hypertension Canada. Um, it affected the BP targets, so you can see the huge var variation um, whether, depending on whether you have low risk or high risk if you have diabetes or you don't. Um, and uh, you can also see, this is maybe a bit too much, uh, if you have no uh, low risk, so no target organ damage or cardiovascular risk factors, then the BP threshold for treatment is more than 160 or 100. Um, this is probably uh, a bit relaxed, uh, but uh, they mentioned that they used the office uh, blood pressure. Uh, so maybe you're talking about 145 over 90 um, in, with, uh, with better uh, BP measurements. But it changed our threshold to treat. Uh, the sorry, third thing. Sorry, Yusuf. Three minutes? Two minutes, please. Two minutes, OK. Uh, the, other thing is um, we look for mast hypertension if we have high risk, even if the patient has normal blood pressure. And this is something that we wouldn't think of uh, before. So uh, we will screen for mast hypertension. We would do out of office uh, blood pressure measurements, uh, HBPM and ABPM. Uh, and I just wanna remind you that this patient had normal blood pressure when they came to your office. So normal blood pressure, but you recognize that the patient has high risk, then you would do ABPM or um, HBPM, home blood pressure monitoring. And the follow-up also, if your patient has high risk, then you would follow them after one month, not three months, not six months. And I'll use my last minute to talk about the future. So we know that hypertension is uh, a combination of genetic dis predisposition and environmental factors. Um, what can we do with the genes? Um, now, there are some monogenic uh, disorders uh, like Liddell syndrome, Gordon syndrome, uh, but we're talking about essential or primary hypertension. It's a polygenic disease. Uh, many, many, many loci associated with BP traits. Uh, and uh, what they found, if you have more of the, these low-risk alleles, then you have a faster increase in BP uh, with age. Um, so this leads us to so-called precision medicine, and um, this hopefully, with pharmacogenomic uh, studies, uh, can lead to a more individualized treatment based on the genetic predisposition of the patient, and it will probably tell us who needs to be treated, and also who 
will respond to what? So who will respond better to A's, who will respond better to uh, CCB, for example? And this is already an example, uh, this study uh, shown on the left, uh, where uh, the yellow is the self-defined um, uh, ethnicity and the blue is the genetic, uh, uh, gen genetically uh, assigned uh, uh, phenotype. And uh, th it showed uh, that the genetics assessment uh, improved the prediction of uh, responding to RAS inhibitor. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, artificial intelligence and hypertension. So our, we can put a lot of information into the machine, including personal, social, uh, and continuous uh, blood pressure readings um, into the machine, which can uh, interpret this and give us uh, a lot of answers. These are examples of things that uh, can be given. So uh, we can measure BP by analyzing the PPG signal, uh, the wearable devices, uh, with improvement, of course, and it can also diagnose hypertension. It can predict our response to treatment and can predict our prognosis. Uh, there is some studies going on in this field, uh, and it looks promising. So my uh, conclusion, no one size fits all. Risk-based approach is more effective and less costly. More individualized treatment in the future with pharmacogenomic uh, and artificial intelligence uh, studies. Thank you.